the MSG Sphere. It has officially opened on Friday, September 29th. 580,000 square feet on the outside. 16K by 16K display on the inside. 170,000 hollow plot speakers. We had two notable AV celebrities, and I don't care if Erica cares that I say that, AV celebrities. Her husband, Joel Carroll, uh, who also works at Immersive, he was physically in attendance. Uh, and our buddy Joe Way from U UCLA now and HETMA. Now, I have heard from Joel that during this event, he and Joe were sitting there standing next to each other, and they just kept looking at each other going, whoa. We got a quote from Joe says, quote, unquote, I just can't figure out how to put the experience into words. And my take on that is, Joe Way was left speechless, so that's saying something. What a discovery! I'm speechless! I mean, this is an absolute coup. The displacement of perspective. Why would- I thought you were speechless! AV Technology gets a Nobel Prize, wrapping up Zoomtopia 2023, and the MSG Sphere is finally open. All that and more, next on AV Week. This is AV Week, episode 633, recorded Friday, October 6th, 2023. Quantum AV. This is AV Week, the biggest stories in AV that we have found. Uh, my name is Malbright. I am your host. With us to discuss those very stories, uh, first and foremost, Dawn Mead. You know her as AV Dawn. How are you, ma'am? Very good, thanks. Thanks for having me, as usual. Absolutely. Also with us is uh, Erica Carroll from Immersive, as well as our Women in AV podcast. How are you, ma'am? Doing well. Hey, Tim. And last but not least, all the way over across the pond, uh, she stayed up late for us, Amelia Coleman. Uh, a futurist, but also one of the hosts of, or the host of our XR Star. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So Zoomtopia happened this week. Zoomtopia 2023 in uh, beautiful uh, Silicon Valley. A number of, of uh, stories came out of this. A number of initiatives came out of it. One of the most notable announcements was Zoom Docs. Now, don't get ahead of me for a second, but yes, it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, Zoom Docs is a collaboration tool. Uh, designed to be more interactive and collaborative than traditional word processing, soft processing software. Zoom Docs includes features like AI-powered content creation and comprehensive table blocks for organizing data and the ability to integrate wikis and shared folders. One of the other couple of things that, that's happening here is uh, Eric Yuan, CEO of Zoom, got on stage and one of the first things that he said, it's not really an announcement, it's more of a statement, said that, quote, unquote, Zoom does not use customer content to train its AI. That was a story that was a, a, a fear that was coming down the pipeline from folks on the internet. It was a combination of Black Mirror, I'm not kidding, uh, and if you never watch Black Mirror, go watch the Netflix one, you'll know which one I'm talking about, uh, but also uh, people looking at the terms and conditions inside Zoom. So he comes out and says, we're not doing this, this is, you know, we're not using your content to program our own AI. Um, Amelia, I'm gonna start with you on this. When it look, when you look at the announcements from Zoom this week, and yeah, Docs is up there because it feels like they've got crosshairs exactly at Google and exactly at Microsoft, but there's also a number of other announcements they made this week. What were some of the biggest ones that you picked up? Yeah, I think it's a lot of really interesting, good announcements. Um, the big kind of headline is that it is becoming an AI company like the other companies that have now been forced their hand to become AI companies. But what I really took away that I think is really fascinating is this idea that they claim to be a federated AI company. So this means that they can use their own AI, but they are also open to using Microsoft's or Google's or Meta's or Anthropic, um, any of the ones that are coming its way. So this could actually give them a huge advantage moving forward because they're not completely married to just one particular AI. And if one develops faster or gets better, they can have that agile ability to switch between them. So that is a really unique approach and potentially a really cool competitive advantage. That's a really good point and one that I did not pick up on. I, I, I saw the, the the federated part. It just didn't strike me as as I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. But that's that's a really good point that they can leverage and use other folks as not just their own. Uh, Dawn, your your take on, on what came down uh, Zoomtopia this week? I was a little bit skeptical when I read that they were coming up with their own version of Docs or Word or whatever you want to call it. 
you know, because we kind of already have Teams and we kind of already have the Google environment and we, you know, obviously Microsoft um, Word and everything. But looking at it from the perspective of having everything in one place, like Teams, but it, it, it brings Zoom up to the same platform or the same level as Teams, which a lot of companies have adopted for their main platform. And to Amelia's point, um, I love the fact that it's federated and that you can use other platforms there because I like it when companies play nice together. And it's not just, you know, for love and peace and goodwill, but it's because it makes my life as an end user, as a technology specifier, a lot easier if I can have someone on a site using Zoom with their AI system, be able to easily talk to someone who's on the Teams infrastructure versus I'm gonna he be here in my own little walled kingdom, good luck talking to me. That's not really conducive to communication or to making business happen. So I like that fact. I think it also lends to the way companies are condensing their tech stacks. Um, more recently on Zoom, they've started doing the chat function that stays with that meeting and you can go back and access it later and you can add to it later, like Teams. Um, but it also adds to the fact that people are using communication in their own organizations, like Slack, for instance, as a primary means of communication. Slack recently introduced their Canvases feature, um, which is also similar. It's a document that people can, you know, continually edit and work towards whatever, you know, their, their project goals are. Um, but in those three players between Zoom and Teams and Slack, you're starting to see so many similarities that it's really lending to that, you know, pick a tech stack that works for your organization instead of having all of them for a very siloed function. Absolutely. All right. Uh, something I don't know that I would ever have guessed that I would going to say, but our next story comes to us from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Don Mead, just for the record. <laughs> The Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2023 was awarded to Munji Boindi of MIT, Louis Brew of Columbia University, and Alexei Ekimov of Nanocrystals Technology for their discovery of quantum dots. Do not turn off this podcast yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, quantum dots are important, and they're important to you, because I will guarantee you, you've leveraged and utilized quantum dots sometime this week and here's how uh in the uh, quantum dots are the tiny particles that have unique properties due to their size they are used in a variety of applications including displays led lamps and medical imaging uh, quantum dots quote unquote eliminate display screens based on qled qled technology as well as led lighting quantum dots are also being used to develop new types of medical imaging that can detect cancer and other diseases earlier than ever before Don, we're going to start on you on this because you're the one that found this story and I am fascinated by it. Uh, I also went down a rabbit trail to see who else in the AV industry ever got a Nobel Prize. The answer is I couldn't find anybody and we'll talk about that in a second. But Don, from your perspective, what does this do for the industry to have a spotlight like the freaking Nobel Prize put on it? I mean, obviously it puts us under the eye of the world. You know, we've said for years we're a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry that nobody knows is a thing. So at least this is really shining that light, no pun intended, quantum, uh, quantum dots, but you know, it, it's really shining a light on our industry. It's weird to my mind that we would get the Nobel prize in chemistry, but it was chem two chemists and a physicist that both discovered and then developed the use of this technology and brought it so that we can have quantum dot LED displays and quantum dot lights and quantum dot, um, you know, walls and things that are whatever comes forward from here. It does have medical applications. It does have non-video applications. You know, it's chemistry. But um, I think it's very exciting that we're kind of in a spotlight for once. And, you know, I'm real good at sniffing out these stories when they put AV in the spotlight from just a completely out of left field area because I get so excited. You know, I've said my entire career, I, I love working in an industry where we get to play with big kid toys, all the shiny, cool stuff and get paid for it. And we're literally one of the most innovative and coolest things around, which we'll talk about in the next story. But I mean, you know, this is this is the Nobels, man. Like people are getting it. I, you know, I would have thought we got a physics one, but I'm down with it. You know, I was very excited. First thing I did, it was like Tuesday, I think, or Wednesday when I saw the, the announcement. 
And I immediately emailed Tim. I was like, dude, we have to talk about this. So um, congrats to the Nobel Chemistry winners and congrats to everyone in our industry already using quantum dots. Um, I think it's going to be a really good thing for us. Erica, one of the things that Erica does really well is, is she educates folks in the industry, right? Um, talk for a second about what this does as you're talking, not just to established folks, you're, you're educating them currently on, on, you know, how to, how to leverage the MRSA platform, but also you're also bringing in new folks into the industry. What does something like this do to an outsider who's, is Don and everybody that's ever been on AV week has said at some point, nobody knows we exist, right? What does something like this do and to help you and other educators as they're bringing new people into the industry? Well, it's certainly a resource for any of us to refer back to, to show that we are relevant, that we do belong in this space. And for kids coming up, even through the Rosie Riveters program, to give them a, a, a hard piece of evidence that says you can also make a difference using cool technology and making the world a better place. Amelia, one of the things that Amelia does is she is a futurist, so I'm going to ask her to look ahead and see what this means, right? Not just, uh, yes, we've been using QLED for, for a while now, right? Uh, but what does this mean for the industry and what does this mean for display technology? Well, I think it's twofold. I agree with Erica that this is an inspiring story and hopefully this inspires more kids to get into STEM and, um, and AV eventually. Um, but also this is a stepping stone foundational technology that off of which the future will unfold and is unfolding. So it's a really important kind of cornerstone of the industry. And because of this story, now we have the a great story to talk about and to share and hopefully uh, get people excited to, to come into this industry. All right, uh, really quickly before we get, move on to the next story, I'm gonna ask each of you in turn, and Don, I'm gonna start with you and I think I know what your answer is going to be. Think for a second about a technology or a person in the industry that absolutely 100% should or should have gotten a Nobel Prize. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I mean, the first name that comes to mind, and I'm not even entirely sure what category other maybe than physics since it has to do with light, but I would say a Delta Berry. Um, she, you know, innovated the silver screen, which you could arguably say innovated Hollywood and brought all of our display technologies to life, uh, made it mainstream. And so I think that's a pretty big deal. And besides Penny would be mad at me if I didn't mention Adele DuBerry, founder of Draper. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, that opening up of the technology world um, by making it mass media consumption through her silver screen, that would be my guess. Slight, slight correction, Adele DuBerry did daylight. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, all right. Um, my bad. Penny's, well, then, Penny, Penny's going to get mad at you anymore. Uh, I know. <laughs> so, um, Erica, same question to you. You know, that's a really great question. And I, honestly, I don't know who's worthy of a Nobel Prize because that is such a huge award. Um, but one huge advancement that I would say deserves more recognition or even to be brought up again is Texas Instruments and digital projection with the DLP chip and um, really revolutionizing the way that we look at pixels on screen. All right, Amelia. Well, to be honest, I'm not really um, that knowledgeable about who's won Nobel Prizes and who hasn't. But uh, the one who came to mind when I think about holographic technology is you have the original Pepper's Ghost and how that still inspires things today. And now they're actually able to split light beams so you can see 3D holographic images without any glasses or anything like that. So whoever was originally responsible for that, uh, maybe, maybe it was Pepper. I don't know if <laughs> Pepper's ghost actually refers to a person, um, but yeah, I, I'd go for that. I'm really surprised that nobody mentioned audio or assistive listening or um, anything like that. So I, I did do, my, the original my, one person that, came, person that came to my head was Dr. Bose. Right, uh, because he is so re re renowned, he he taught at MIT for years. He did not ever get a Nobel Prize. I have no idea if there, he was ever up for one. I think I don't think that's a thing you can find out really. Uh, he got a number of other accolades. Um, the other person I would I would think is Philo Farnsworth. And if you don't know that name, go wiki it and go down a rabbit trail. This is the kid from the cornfields of Nebraska that, honest to God, gave us TV. Right, he he's the one who who kind of figured it out originally. 
there's a whole court case and RCA sued the bejesus out of him and, and some other stuff. But um, those are the two people. Um, OLED technology is, is the technology that I would love to see get a little bit more light. Um, and then honestly, the, the folks who do uh, line arrays, uh, the ability to steer audio with physics, right? So that right there is just a phenomenal story that I don't know that anybody has, has told quite quite well enough yet. So it sounds like we need a lobbying group for our industry within the Nobel community. We probably have some friends over in Sweden, like one or two. You know, I don't know. All right. Last story. Uh this is actually from Aviation. The MSG sphere, which we've talked an awful lot about and we're going to continue to talk about it, dag gummit, because Infocom is in Vegas next year and that's the home of the sphere. It has officially opened on Friday, September 29th. You too Chris in the sphere with the first residency. Uh, you can check out TikTok. You can check out YouTube. Just type in U2 and the sphere. Uh, all kinds of videos from this amazing experience. 580,000 square feet on the outside. 16K by 16K display on the inside. 170,000 hollow plot speakers. 170,000 hollow plot speakers. Okay, yeah. 170,000 speakers. Um, we had two notable av celebrities and i don't care if erica cares that i say that av celebrities her husband joel carroll uh, who also works at immersive he was physically in attendance uh and our buddy joe way from U ucla now and hetma was also there we got a quote from joe says quote unquote i just can't figure out how to put the experience into words and my take on that is joe way was left speechless so that's saying something all right that's enough joking um Erica, we're going to start with you on this. What is the biggest benefit of the industry for this $2.3 billion work of art and technology coming together? I think that it's an amazing experience in innovation and creativity and pushing the boundaries about what could be. Now, I have heard from Joel that during this event, he and Joe were sitting there standing next to each other and they just kept looking at each other going, Whoa. So <laughs> there was a lot going on. So I will say this though, they had that view from the floor. Um, and it was amazing. It's very immersive and you can't tell the difference of what's real and what's not when you're standing there. And, um, it looks like there's a concrete wall around you and it's not really concrete. Um, but the second night, he went again and he sat up in the balcony and got a totally different experience because the sound refracted differently within the, the sphere. And he said it was actually more pinpointed. At one point in the show, there's a helicopter that goes up and around and the sound travels with the image at any point you could look directly at it. So, yeah, the 170,000 speakers absolutely did their job and made it a true experience. Now, what that means for AV, I think it's just raising the bar in general. Everybody else is gonna have to go, you know, what else can we do? How can we really make this an exciting experience for the end user, for the customer? Um, and it might even push the boundaries about what we're doing in offices. All right, Amelia, uh, I mentioned the fact that this is the, this is the first time they've done this. There's actually one on the drawing board right now to be put up in the UK as well. It's on the drawing board, so don't get too excited yet. But there'll be another one sometime in the next five, 10 years. Uh, talk for a second about what this means, right, to the industry, but also to be able to highlight. Again, this is the second time we're, we're really talking about highlighting the industry, but this really does um, put a spotlight on the industry. You look at the celebrities that were there uh, at, the, at the opening, uh, John Hamm, which again, St. Louis guy, but I just thought it was cool that John Hamm was there. Um, you know, a number of artists, a number of, of um, you know, actors and stuff like that. And then you kick it off with, with a band like you too. What does that do to the industry? I think it just underlines that immersive is here and that 3D experiences aren't necessarily the thing anymore. We have now moved into 4D and 40 plus and the creative possibilities here are really astounding. And I think that this is the natural evolution. And I think that we are going to see this play out 
across the board when it comes to changing expectations of what entertainment should be and also how we consume media and and AV and entertainment. Um, that's interesting about the UK. I hadn't heard that one. I have friends who live in Vegas and they're actually really annoyed by the sphere because they're saying they're driving their cars and they have this big, huge screen showing them all kinds of stuff. And that's really distracting and it's causing lots of accidents. So that's the word on the street. <laughs> I wonder if they'll turn it off or keep it on during the F1 race because that that's happening in the streets of Vegas in November. So Oof. that's a good point. Um, Don, uh, Amelia brought up the, the 40 plus, and, and I'll, I want to list this out here because I, I, I did in the article, obviously you have visual, right? 16 K you have 170,000 screen or uh, speakers. That's audio. The seats are rumble seats. So they'll vibrate depending on, on what you're, you're watching. They have the ability to do, to raise or lower the temperature 10 degrees over the entire thing in like three seconds. They have the ability to put sense smells in the space and then the sixth one they had these ginormous wind machines at the front that will go 110 miles an hour if they want them to so yeah this is an experience <laughs> so ms dawn what does this do for the industry again i think it highlights both where we're going and really gives us something to point to for customers and potential customers. But I also think it's a pretty good example of where we've been and how we got there. Mm. Um, if you look at the history of like theme parks, or even I mentioned, you know, the silver screen last story, the, the history of theaters back in the fifties, when they first put in theater seats that would kind of buzz a little, or they'd blow some wind on you. Um, some of the big theme parks, I'm looking at you this past Infocom in Orlando, um, where they would put scents in and they would put wind or temperature to control things. All of these have built immersive experiences and even things like projection mapping um, at the theme parks and then going out into the real world, people are starting to be more aware of our industry, even if they don't know it's our industry. And I I mean, just this week when, when they started showing videos of the U2 experience and, and what's going on with the sphere, I had conversations with total strangers on Facebook that, you know, from the community in my area who were like, that's amazing. How did they get the projection on that? And so I got to say, well, first of all, yay, you know what projection mapping is. But, you know, a couple of years ago, nobody would understand that that was us. But then I was able to explain, no, it's more an LED wall and and, and it's basically a giant jumbotron, but cooler, you know. And I think it's, it's really showing that we've come a long way. We're integrating things better and better as time goes on. And I think it really gives us an example of where things are going to be, because like you said, experiences are here. I mean, that's what it is. And if you're not on board with that, if you're just still putting up a thing on the wall or look at a PowerPoint, then you're missing out because we can do so much more. So let me ask a, a question here. And I, I, I say this, I, I'm not poking fun at, at Toby. Toby Tungle is a gentleman I worked with here at, at CTI. He had actually, he took my job as, as CMO. I'm no longer running marketing. I am, I am all aviation now. And Toby posted an article the other day about swag. Um, and I, I, I poke fun of him online because it's easy. But his, his, his article, the article actually made a whole lot of sense. And, and it says, in essence, the experience is the new swag. Don't give me a freaking pen. Give me an experience. Give me something I will connect with emotionally to you as a customer or as a vendor. Does that ring true to anybody here where, where the experience now is going to be the new swag? It's, it's no longer going to be a dollar pen. It's going to be, you know, taking me somewhere or letting me experience something that I don't have the opportunity to anywhere else. I've been saying that for years and, um, you know, I don't want to say that it's fallen on deaf ears, but it's certainly much more expensive to do, but those, those memorable experiences is sort of where you draw that connection in the first place. It's not about keeping a pen on my desk. So you're top of mind. I want to see a picture of the experience that you took me on and remember the feeling I had when I did something with your brand. I agree entirely. And it's not a specific brand, but one of the things that stands out most in my mind is several years ago before COVID at Infocom down near the food court, 
uh, I can't remember what it was, Infocom or a specific brand, but they had this experience where they took you up in swings, oh, yeah, up yeah, to yeah. the top of the of the center, and then you had video and audio while you were up there, isolated, just you and like five other people hanging on this giant swing, however many feet up in the air. It was phenomenal. It was like it sticks in my mind so much, mm -hmm. and it was an experience and things like that that you know are unusual. Um, in the fall, I was in Vegas with some friends just casually. And we went to the art exhibit uh, down in Area 51 in Vegas. Omega Mart. Omega Mart, yes. Um, it was amazing. It was phenomenal. And there was so much AV there. But to your average person, they have no idea it's AV. So I, that's where we are. I mean, if you don't have an experience, we're not going to remember it, even if we have the T-shirt. What I just heard was bring back the puppies. Oh, don't give me the puppies. <laughs> I think they should because I didn't get to see the puppies because I had to leave early this year. That's actually how I got started in this industry. I was at a conference and there was a booth that had really amazing experiential technology, things I'd never seen before, like a virtual book and holograms and early augmented reality. And I was so fascinated by it that I just kept going over and asking lots of questions and then bringing my people over and explaining to them what had been explained to me. And somebody said, do you work for us? And I said, no, but I should. And that was, you know, over 10 years ago now. And that's how I got started. So I think um, it's definitely a lot to be said for offering memorable experiential experiences, I guess. Yes. All right. That'll be a good place to, to leave us before you start talking about puppies anymore. John Mead, <laughs> uh, how do people find you? Well, you can't find me at work because I'm not allowed to tell you where I work. But you can always find me online at AV Dawn or uh, Dawn Mead on, on LinkedIn and the more serious things. I'm also on AV Week as much as Tim will let me be. Um, and uh, you can occasionally find me at actual real life trade shows and events. So I uh, look forward to seeing you at one of those. All right. Very good. Amelia Coleman, thank you, ma'am. How do people connect with you? Yes. So I'm active on LinkedIn and on Instagram as Futurist Amelia. And I also have a wonderful podcast called XR Star, which is hosted on AV Nation. All right. And she also has a fantastic newsletter that you need to subscribe to as well. Uh, that has all kinds of futuristic stuff. Oh, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, I forgot. The Big Reveal, um, which is also on YouTube, or you can look at it on my website, which is ameliacallman.com. And finally, last but not least, uh, Erica Carroll. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, how do people connect with you or Immersive? Well, you can find me in all of the places at the Erica Carroll. You can find Immersive at Immersive.com. You can find Rosie Riveters at avgives.com. And you can find our podcast, The Women in AV, at avnation.tv. Uh, for me, for Tim Albright, do not follow me on X or LinkedIn or anywhere else. Because at this point in my life, I'm celebrating one win by the Chicago Bears. One singular win that's what we got, and I'm going to take it. Uh, but go by the website, if you would, please. avnation.tv. That's avnation.tv. You'll find this program, Amelia's program, Erica's program, and a whole host of others. Uh, at this recording, we just posted a brand new EdTech with Aaron May Moran, so check that out as well. Uh, from a, a, a travel log standpoint, uh, I will be in New York for a, an event with Pace University at the end of, of November. And then a couple of us are running out to Vegas for Digital Science Expo and LDI. That is the first week of December. So all that and more at avnation.tv. That's avnation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching. That's all the time we have for AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is, is AV, AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation.